Scanlon Brooks has created quite a name and resume for someone who just turned 21 years old. The Los Angeles native is best known for the 2013 coming-of-age Sundance movie, The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete. Well, there have been several great projects since then, but these days, I'm nominating Scanlon as Best Supporting Actor for his new role in the movie Arch Enemy. Say hi to Scanlon Brooks. Hey, everybody. So glad you're tuning in to Hollywood Live. And as usual, we got a great one for you today. My guest is one of Hollywood's brightest rising stars. Uh, you know him, you love him. I'm talking about Scanlon Brooks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Well, you got a new movie that you got a major role in, uh, Arch Enemy. And, you know, people, you've really been around, you know, you're all of what? 20 years old now? How old are you now? Scott? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I am 21 years old now. Oh, tw- oh you're legal now. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Uh-oh. Yeah, legal. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, at 21, you people really started recognizing you all the way back in 2013 uh, for, for the work that you did then. But before we even talk about that, tell me about the movie Arch Enemy, because it's really... It's a thriller. It's kind of fantastical. And I'll let you tell the plot. Oh, well, um, Arch Enemy is about a man who fell through a different dimension who had superpowers. Um, And as much as it is kind of in trailers as a kind of like a superhero film, it's it's more about the journey of him and his redemption. Um, And when he falls through this dimension, he meets uh, this young man who basically wants to tell stories and he believes in him and actually inspires him to become the hero that he kind of was in a sense. And they go on this journey where Max Fist is his name, ends up redeeming himself in a sense, um, but also trying to take on the drug and crime, uh, the, the drugs and crime uh, in that city that he ends up in. Yeah. Well, it's it's very, the trailers are looking good. I honestly have not seen the entire movie yet. I, I intend to do that before it comes out. <laughs> But, um, but you have, you know, this is kind of, I mean, you've been in a lot of projects and a lot of movies, but this is really your first one, isn't it? Where you almost taking the lead or, you know, you're the second man out there anyway. Oh man. Um, I would say that in a sense, I can kind of compare this to my role in, I would say darkest minds where it kind of had superpowers in a sense, um, mm-hmm. still, still leading, uh, but also kind of helped carry the main character in a sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Def- definitely i mean you know this this one is this is a good one for that supporting actor nod yeah yeah <laughs> yeah this this is the one i just want you to know this, this oh thank be, you this will be the one um you know it's it's so interesting we are living in what can i say everybody is saying that we're, we're living in these unprecedented times and as a young man who's out there and you've got a lot of Instagram followers, how do you keep young people, especially positive with your posts and things like that, that you're doing these days? Well, for me, I try to keep people updated with, I would say the positive things that I try to pull out of, you know, what I do or creatively trying to give people, you know, a a little bit of hope, you know, to Mm -hmm. something that, you know, of course, they're not sure. They're really uncertain about how things are going to end up, you know. But I just use my projects as kind of like a, a beacon of just saying, hey, you know, try and take your mind off. Feel good, you know what I'm saying? Um, but, I mean, I really just try myself to focus on positive things and post positive affirmations or or um, try, try to make it so much about myself, you know, try to keep it relatable to what people around the world can kind of feel and you know, even myself, I've been kind of down a little bit just watching the the state of the world go, you know, haywire. <laughs> As you can yeah. see, it's a mess. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we're alive and breathing every day and we get to go to the next day to, you know, do something new and, and experience life still. So it's a blessing regardless. I try to focus on that. I, I, you are so right and, and so wise for for a young man. I mean, that's exactly what it ends up being about, especially at a time like this, um, you know, growing up in Los Angeles has its advantages and, and then some disadvantages too. <laughs> I, I would imagine I grew up here and, and kind of like right 
after the whole Rodney King thing and all that stuff that was going on here, how would you say that it affected you in a positive way, all the stuff that has gone on in this city? Because there's been a lot, the riots and everything, you know, from, from Rodney King to George Floyd. Man. How would you put that into a little capsule? I mean, for me, my parents grew up around the Rodney uh, King time and George Floyd happened this year. So I got to actually experience the whole, the whole, um, you know, riot issue, which I've never seen on, on, on that scale before, especially where it's in your face, it's in TV. And, um, you know, there's a lot of racism out there. I believe from the Rodney King time, though, there was a lot of education um, about how to combat or how to, you know, deal with racism on a scale in, in, in front of your face. Um, you know, I've been called names before and everything, and it doesn't bother me. I don't let it bother me to the point where it causes, it gets a reaction uh, for, for the other person. And um, I believe that people are more aware, and I think that they are a lot more cautious and careful when they um, get or see situations in front of them that can escalate to a certain point. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think that collectively as a people, we are starting to see and mobilize in a different sense where we are starting to come together more um, because there's not a lot coming from any other side. We have to stick together. So yeah. some, there, there is some unity happening there and I, I feel like we should focus on that and continue to uplift that. Um, because, I, I, you know, I, at, at this point, we need every brick involved, you know, yeah. to, to build this, to build this castle that we need to stand on. So. Yeah, you are so right. And we, we started way long time ago when the slaves built the White House. That's a whole yeah. other story. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's I just had to bring that up. I don't know why that came out. But anyway, um, you know, let, let's have a little bit of fun. So what's on your playlist, you know, your music playlist? And if you were going to do a versus, who would you set up a versus with? Oh, a versus? Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, this, this is the first person that came to mind. I love him as an artist. He is unique. Um, I would say uh, Saba. Um, oh. Saba, yeah. I... I, I was really inspired by him when he came out with his uh, his album, uh, Care For Me. And I think that was like 2017, I can't remember. But I I, I, I really enjoy his flow, his his music. Um, and if I was to do a versus, I gotta give me a little catalog first. I got some stuff in there, but I gotta like, I gotta bring it up a little more to, to do that. But I would love to do a versus with him. Nothing but love on that one. Yeah. I, okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll put that out in the universe. That's oh, something man. good for 2021. We could probably help arrange that. We'll work oh, that one man. out. <laughs> <laughs> we got another big one coming here. So what project is in your heart and soul that you just feel like you have to do right now after, especially, I mean, after Arch Enemy comes out and people are going to be singing your praises again. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's next? Um, I heard, and I'm really interested. So if if they see this, um, <laughs> let's talk. Uh, Static Shock. I heard Static Shock is very early in. Uh, what to say? Like basically pre-production, um, and it's you know pre-development. And uh -huh. he's a he's a young black su uh, superhero, um, mm -hmm. similar to Miles Morales in Black Spider Man. Um, but Static Shock is a hero that I would like to portray in a sense. I would, I would definitely love to talk about that. And um, if that's possible, I would be 100% down for that. Hey, hey, everything's possible. You know? Yeah, any, anything's possible. Anything is possible. It, it really is. And, and speaking of superheroes, you know, we, we lost our big one. He was a superhero in real life and on the screen. That, of course, is Chadwick. Uh, Bozeman mm -hmm. this year. Uh, as a young actor and, and looking up to someone like, what would you say about Chadwick and what he left for us? It is an honor to see someone who represents us on the screen. That, um, and then in, in that stature, but 
he was a class act. There was there was something special about him where he took the craft to another level. And as a young black man who's been doing this for a long time, I would say almost 13 years, uh, which is crazy for me to even say, but that my game still has a lot more to go. And I would say that as far as choices and roles are standing on what I believe, because one thing that um, when, when, when I watched, I, I watched his interviews, um, shortly after he passed um, and he was very focused and, 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 and he carried a lot of his roles with intent for future, future roles. And, you know, I don't even think it was a case of, of, of legacy for him, but it was more so that, that he was fully into what he wanted to do and he didn't half hand anything. So I want to carry that with me. And I feel like it's necessary that if there's something that you don't necessarily vibe with or that's not you, and, you know, as long as it's not with malicious intent, that it's okay for you to say no to things or that's okay for you to look at the prize that you want to get and achieve that um, straight, straight on. Oh, you are so right. So, so wise you are. Where did all that wisdom come from? <laughs> hey, yeah, hey, you got to think. They think Mama Dukes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mama and them, huh? I know Mama and them yep. always come through for us, don't they? Yes. Well, yes. listen, uh, I, I'm so thrilled for you. And I just, uh, I've been around for a long time. And I know really pretty much everybody I've predicted that would be a big star ended up at some point being a big star. I'm predicting <laughs> that for you. Um, oh, you know, man. got a ways to go, but you are really well on your way, Scanlon. So we're very proud of you, and we're really Thank proud you. of the way you represent all of us. Uh, what would you, one last word, one last word about Arch Enemy, what would that be to the audience? I would say, even though it's, you know, in a sense, market, marketed as a superhero film, I would say for sure that it's a film about superheroes and their emotions, and that they have an emotional too. Um, and that it's a movie about trust, friendship, it's about a bond um, and it's, and you know, you can't do everything together. Um, some, some roads you have to take alone, but at some point you have to remember and realize that you aren't alone. Um, and, you know, technically in this movie, um, you can't do anything alone. So just, just remember that you're in it together and that uh, it's a friendship to the very end. <laughs> Oh, so you're right. We are all, as they keep trying to tell us, we're all in this together. Exactly. So listen, you stay safe. Come back and see us anytime. You're always welcome. Appreciate it. And uh, and good luck with the movie. And we'll we'll be seeing you on the next one. Yeah. Um. You actually be seeing me very soon. Um. There's another film coming up. Uh. That's the sci-fi, and I got some music coming out. So hopefully, Sava, if you're seeing this, man, I'm coming. <laughs> We're we going to hook up the verses on this one. Okay. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. So get ready. Get ready. I'm getting ready. Get ready. Okay. All Marla. right. Thank you and happy holidays to you. Thank you. Likewise. A lot of attention has been given to the state of Georgia during these elections, but the story you probably haven't heard about is the feature documentary, Welcome to Pine Lake. It delves beneath the surface of a tranquil, inclusive community just outside of Atlanta and talks about the foundation of historical systematic racism. Well, the director and executive producer joined me to talk about this important story today. Say hello to Wendy Ely Jackson and Elisa Gambino. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today on Hollywood Live. Boy, we've got quite a show for you, as usual. Uh, two industry veterans, Elisa Gambino, who's a director, and Wendy Ely Jackson, who is an executive producer. Together, they came up with a documentary called Welcome to Pine Lake. Um, it's something that they started out with one idea, and it ended up being a really interesting look at racism, on a really, on a level that we don't normally think of or see. Ladies, welcome to Hollywood Live. Thanks for joining me today to talk about your extraordinary uh, piece of work here. Um, I've got to ask you what, you know, Welcome to Pine Lake is a documentary about a little community, kind of an idyllic community, 12 miles from Atlanta. We all know about Atlanta. We may not know about Pine Lake. And you started out doing this documentary because all of the elected officials were female which was kind of an interesting story, but you found something else. Tell me about it. 
Well, in 2018, when so many women were running for um, elected office, I was really inspired by this. I think as women, we often wonder what would this world look like if we ran it, if we were in charge. We, and, and so I started doing some research to find, to see if maybe there was a county or a city or somewhere in, in, this, in the United States that was already run completely by women. And it so happens that there was a, a city 12 miles from my house here in Atlanta, so in the suburbs of Atlanta, a little city um, with an all-female um, city council, so the mayor and the five uh, council members, a female um, municipal judge, a female chief of police, a female city administrator, a female prosecutor, so, and the three small uh, ent entities within the city government all run, so 15 women run wow. the city. There's not a single man in a position of authority there. Wow. And so you, in doing this, which is a story in itself, but you realize that we, even with that, there was this institutional racism that underlied everything. And it's a kind of the underbelly of all of that. Uh, Wendy, can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, it, um, thanks for having us. Uh, you know, a lot of times we elect officials and some of those officials, they are not necessarily um, unbeknownst to them. There are still laws on the books that have not been changed. Um, I don't think there's a city in America that doesn't have some type of archaic uh, laws that are there. Um, right. But this city, as progressive as they are, uh, when this, this kind of came to light, I don't think that they were, they were aware um, I think that this is kind of floats into the area of unconscious bias. Um, and uh, it was, it was bleeding, bleeding forth with everything. And you see one thing, of course, as you've seen in the documentary, you've got one life, the, the residents that live there, and that's juxtaposed to the people that you see in the courtroom. And uh, that kind of said it all. It's interesting because one of the things that you discovered is that people who didn't live there but would come through that town because it's, it's kind of not hard to go through there because it's so close to Atlanta, they were getting them for park for tickets, you know, and, and that's how they were getting money for this little town. And it turns out that many of the folks were black and then they'd end up in court. I'll explain that a little bit better than I just did. So um, Pine Lake has um, a slip of county road that's one quarter mile long that goes through the edge of town. Pine Lake was established over 80 years ago as a whites only small city. And it as a little fishing community for, um, for uh, people from Atlanta to travel to on the weekends and fish and camp. And so, um, and it was established as a city. So there's this little uh, slip of road that goes through there. In the 90s, when white flight happened to that part of DeKalb County and, and into big parts of DeKalb County in general, uh, uh, whites left, but this little city of Pine Lake, this, it stayed because mm. they had their own police force. They didn't feel the need to flee for whatever reasons other people were fleeing. They felt that, they, so this isn't a situation of gentrification. This is a situation of, this is a, a city that stayed white, mm. predominantly white. And so um, there's this ticketing that happens on this county road that goes through the edge of town. And most of the tickets are, they're not speeding tickets. You practically can't speed down that road because it's, there are three stoplights. These are tickets that um, spring from conditions of poverty. So lack of um, have, having an expired tag, having lack of insurance, things like this. And so um, the city council doesn't fund the police at a high enough level that they can not Ticket. And so at the top, one end of the pipeline is the city council that does not fund the police. And then the, the police chief and her officers, they ticket on this road. Um, but if they were funded properly, they wouldn't have to do it. And the people that travel down this road are predominantly black. And so mm. in the courtroom, almost exclusively black people. The many times we filmed there, we did not see any white people there. Wow. Wow. Everybody is looking at Georgia right now because, you know, of the upcoming election there for Senate, the senatorial race, which has just been unbelievable. Um, so why, you know, this, this, this particular story right now seems so important because of just that Senate race. Um, you know, and I'll be very open about it. I'm a Democrat. Yeah. So I want the Democratic candidate to win. Um, I think it's very important for our current 
coming incoming administration. But all of that being said, from both of your opinions, why is this documentary, why does this play into all of that right now? Well, um, I'm originally from Atlanta, uh, uh, myself and my husband, and I can, t I can say with all certainty, Atlanta has always been the place since before Reconstruction um, where hope and pragmatism met in terms of race relations, of how Atlanta's been able to move forward. Um, but Atlanta being the deep blue place, it's, it's maintained uh, that stance actually since uh, Governor Lester Maddox in the, uh, the late 50s. There are some things that outside of Atlanta and Pine Lake is in DeKalb County. DeKalb County is one of our biggest counties, but it all in, in one of the most diverse counties, there are some things that have to change. With this election, one of the things that I do love, um, Raphael Warnock, who's actually my pastor, and John Ossoff, they understand that you have to have a team of people that can go in and look at things in a, on a forensic level to make changes and for, for things to truly be progressive. Okay, that's not to say that people don't, can't have certain conservative values, but equality is, remains important. Um, inclusion remains important and making sure that you um, get rid of a lot of biases that uh, perpetuate, um, could perpetuate violence, more poverty, um, and more oppression are important. And I believe um, both of the candidates that are actually running, I'm a Democrat as well, um, uh, understand that. And so that's what makes Georgia, and in, in, it's not just a, a cradle of civil rights, but the people that are running for this office are, are, are people that really want freedom for all. What do you think is going to happen down there in January in this election? Alisa? <laughs> I, like, I, I have to choose optimism for Warnock and also yeah. for the state of Georgia because I'm tired of not choosing optimism. And I think that this election, the presidential election, showed us that optimism can motivate people much more than hate speech and um, divisiveness. So I believe that that we're going to have two new senators. Oh, good. I, I really hope so. We're all counting on it down there. If we could all come down. We've been helping out as much as we can uh, here from California. Uh, I, I do have to ask you, you know, your documentary, of course, was one of the highest rated documentaries, actually one of the first documentaries on the CBS uh, format. Uh, their doc, their, one of their new formats. And so it is available on CBS. Is that where we find this? So this is the first feature documentary that CBSN has ever streamed. So it cycles through, I think last weekend it was on uh, CBSN, it was streaming. And so you can find it on CBSN, on Hulu, on Showtime, Showbet, which is the partnership between Showtime and BET also aired it. So um, it's on the CBSN website. Um, it's in a, it's on a many, you know, it's, it's just pretty easily accessible. Right, multiple platforms. Alisa, I have to ask you, you have been a correspondent for CNN. You've covered wars, literally, all over the planet. Um, and being here in the United States and being an American citizen and, and looking at us being at war here, you know, really some people wanted to start a civil war. That's not going to happen. But since you've covered wars all over the world, what would you say about this time in America and our kind of moment of reckoning? Yeah, I um, so I was a producer for CNN for from 1987 until 2000, and yes, I was in the Middle East and um, uh, Europe. I I was uh, covered a lot of um, conflict, and um, and I think that we have to recognize that incremental change only serves one group of people in this country right now. And I think when George Floyd died we realized that these conversations about the wheels of government turn slowly, that change is slow, that it, it's, it, it's not acceptable anymore. Incremental change, we need change. So when I look at Pine Lake and I hear all the excuses about why they can't change, even though they've known that this has been a problem for 20 years, and that you know uh, they're not there yet, that only serves the the, the council and the citizens of Pine Lake. It doesn't serve the people driving down Rockbridge Road who are having their pockets picked. 
so I think in this moment of reckoning, this idea that we, it needs to happen now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the way we're all feeling. And I thank both of you ladies for all that you're doing. Uh, anything else coming up? Are you two collaborating again anytime soon on anything? We are. We are. <laughs> we're, uh, we're always collaborating. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're are always uh, collaborating. But no, I think we, we're, we're formulating what our third act will be on a, um, uh, another documentary. And I'm, I'm just, I have to say, uh, Elisa and... Um, the DP slash director, who's also her husband, um, they are, have been amazing, amazing to collaborate, collaborate with their brilliant, um, not just filmmakers, but they're the salt of the earth people. And this has been a, a, real, a, a wonderful opportunity to work with them. Well, I think both of you two really kind of show what can happen when people from different backgrounds, different races, uh, different whatever come together to do something very positive. So congratulations to both of you. Thank you. And, and be sure to let come back again whenever you next you know finish your next one. <laughs> In the meantime, everybody check out Welcome to Pine Lake on CBS and a bunch of other places you can find it. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And everybody out there, thanks for joining us today on Hollywood Live. We keep bringing it to you. You know, no matter how long the quarantine is going on, even afterwards, we'll be here. So don't forget to tune in. Thanks.